we've travelled the country filming 24 sensational New Zealanders. They're finalists in the 2015 Attitude Awards, an event celebrating the achievements of New Zealanders living with disability. Vote for your favourite in each of the eight categories at attitudelive.com. I am space very ST stubborn. Nick Chisholm's life and his physical body are testament to his phenomenal strength of character. Fifteen years ago, Nick sustained a serious head injury playing rugby. It left him with locked-in syndrome. He can't communicate verbally due to the complex paralysis of nearly all voluntary muscles in his body, except for his eyes. Determined to rehabilitate, he took up bodybuilding. Initially, it took five therapists just to help him stand. He trained three hours every day. The outcome? A ripped physique. In 2014, he won the New Zealand Wheelchair Bodybuilding Champs. Nick also helps organise an annual tennis side rugby tournament. This year, more than $11,000 was raised for the New Zealand Rugby Foundation's Seriously Injured Player Fund. Sean Prenderville may look like any 15-year-old boy, but this gutsy teenager has waited five long years to be well enough to get back to the sports he loves. I, I've got so many things that I want to do and try. I'm a lot more confident and I've really come to terms with, with my whole leg and everything. My motto is no limits and I'm going to stick by that. Diagnosed at the age of 10 with an aggressive osteocarcinoma in his right leg, he spent two years in hospital. Much of that time he was in isolation as doctors treated a rare life-threatening blood disorder, a reaction to the chemotherapy. What sort of helped me through all this was family and um, just seeing my sisters. Sean was then confronted with complex surgery. The middle section of his leg was amputated and in a process known as rotation plasty, surgeons reattached his foot backwards. His ankle became his new knee. Before I was always told that I wasn't going to make it or I was going to lose my leg and I wasn't going to be able to walk again but I've sort of just pushed the limits and I've got this end result that is just Superb. Singing is everything. I love it. It's what I do when I'm sad, it's what I do when I'm happy, it's what I do when I'm having a bad day, and it's what I do when I'm having a great day. Smart and sassy, Alicia Lipscomb excelled in the education system. So one thing I learned going through the school system was that it's not always equipped to deal with people who have disabilities or learning difficulties. It was less of my fault and more of an environmental problem. A Fulbright scholar, she now helps other students with disabilities to succeed. I volunteer by helping out here at Victoria University doing proofreading for students with dyslexia and dyspraxia. Alicia lives with a nerve condition, complex regional pain syndrome, that has resulted in vision loss. The primary challenges come from the physical limitations of a pain condition that also causes like muscle deterioration and mobility problems. So music has always been what I've enjoyed. It's played a massive role in my life. It's kind of like you see an aspect of yourself that maybe you haven't seen before. Art has always been at the core of who Julia Jackson is. She expresses her creativity through sculpture and writing. Well, I guess it is a way of talking about whatever I'm sort of going through at the time. Several years after graduating from the Elam School of Fine Arts, an accident resulted in her total loss of sight. After a period of trauma and depression, it took enormous determination to regain her artistic vocation. I have quite a clear idea in my head, but then as I'm working, usually that changes. It just evolves. <laughs> When I'm dancing, it just feels amazing. Like, just the feel in the body, it's just such an amazing way of movement. 
As a young boy, Salem Fox struggled to find focus. Dance has transformed him into a young man who achieves distinction in his exams. I dance almost every single day. Although only 15, he's already performed four times with the Royal New Zealand Ballet. I think dance has helped me a lot with my Asperger's. Before I was four, I didn't talk. I would communicate by um, hitting and screaming, and I found that w with dance, that helped a lot with its discipline. It helped in keeping me focused. Over to the spread out. Salem teaches and is a popular role model for young dancers. His blog, Ballet Boy NZ, is used as a resource at the London Boys Ballet School. Point those feet. I absolutely love teaching and I just hope with all of my passion we rub off onto them. Dancing is my life, really. I live, breathe and eat dancing. Yaniv Jansen has already exhibited his paintings in five countries. Diagnosed on the autism spectrum as a child, Yaniv's painting has helped him with communication. I imagine in my head how the painting is going to look like with the colours and shapes and everything on there, the meaning even. Yaniv's book, Changing the World One Painting at a Time, was adopted by UNESCO as a resource for teachers. The aim? To raise awareness of the contributions of people living with disabilities. Yaniv's paintings have an environmental or social message. The painting is about um, everybody's livings, rich and middle class and poor. So life is much easier for some people, but life is much harder for some people. My dream is to be a famous painter. Getting on the court, it's pretty exciting. Going out there with the whole team and we get goosebumps and that, especially I guess playing against other countries as well, so I never thought that that was going to happen anytime soon. Four years ago, this was Cody Emerson, 15 years old and newly disabled after a school rugby injury. Roll on to 2015. Today, Cody is a talented member of the New Zealand Wheel Blacks. He's represented New Zealand internationally and uses the confidence he's gained to motivate others. Being involved in sport has definitely helped me being more independent, just for driving and getting out and about, more, being more social, and that is, rugby's definitely helped me. He's keen to ensure his hometown of Christchurch becomes one of the most accessible in the world. I don't think life's over when you have an accident. It's a bit more of a beginning. It's what you do after it which really oh, defines okay. what sort of person you are, and that's what I've found. I haven't let it stop me. I love sailing because of the freedom and how different it is from sitting in a wheelchair. Otis Horn has a strong sense of adventure. He started sailing at the age of 13 and within months was sailing solo. My fear is being in water. So sailing is part of trying to conquer that fear. Born with spina bifida, Otis has endured nine major surgeries and one major fall while sailing. I went sailing from Wellington to Nelson and on the eighth day, I broke my leg. On the 10th day, I skippered the boat into Nelson, then went straight to hospital, found out my leg was broken in three. In 2015, he sailed solo across the Cook Strait, an 11-hour journey confronting four-metre swells in his three-and-a-half-metre boat. Sailing gives me the freedom, makes me feel like I can do anything I want. Selwyn Jensen is a classic Kiwi bloke and was a champion shearer before a car accident left him tetraplegic. I shore sheep for 20 years and that was blimmin' hard work. The fielding man knew determination and physical strength would be key to his life post-accident. Pain's your friend and just power through it, I suppose. Selwyn's high level of injury means he needs four carers to look after him. Sport represents independence. I actually enjoy the speed and I'm in charge of myself and the challenge. I like to be able to keep up with other cyclists. Initially, Selwyn took up wheelchair rugby. These days, hand cycling is his passion. He's entered cycling events all over the North Island. My life philosophy is to 
shove as much in while you're here. Don't take life for granted. Just enjoy it. Catherine McBride makes Wellington an even more interesting place through her acting, dancing and performing. Two, three, four. She's currently a member of JDK, a hip-hop dance group that aims to challenge people's perception of disability through dance. Catherine, what are you good at? Hip-hop, I think you're really good at helping people. Yeah. It's her contribution off the stage that's getting her noticed. She's a member of Active Activists, a youth group for people with intellectual disabilities who identify issues they want to change in their community. It's really hard for you to cry? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot. Catherine also volunteers four hours a week at Kaibosh. She helps to sort and distribute food to different charities in need. This outgoing girl has a message for those with a negative perception of disability. Well, hey, yeah. yeah, good. From an early age, Rachel Berry has fought for the rights of deaf youth. At 14, she set up her first deaf youth group in Christchurch. At 18, she moved to Auckland to work for Deaf Aotearoa. Now she's studying for a bachelor's degree in health and social development. When I was young, uh, I was the same as others. I, I just didn't have a um, way of knowing where I belonged in the world. I felt really unsure of my path. And now that I've grown and I have that deaf awareness, I know where I fit. And so the fact that I can help them to contribute and know where they belong in the world is really cool. This year, the 20-year-old represented New Zealand at the World Federation of the Deaf Youth Camp in Turkey. What I love about my work with the youth is seeing them grow and seeing them becoming happy, content people and feeling like they belong. Rachel is now planning her own organisation for deaf and hard of hearing youth. We need to be able to understand each other as humans and be able to look um, through a situation from each other's perspective. It'll come as no surprise that confident 15-year-old student Muskan Durta is the youngest New Zealander to deliver a TEDx speech. Muskan has a high profile among high school students through her talks, books and radio program. If I help someone and they have a smile on their face, it just makes me feel so good about myself. Muskan was four years old when her family moved from India to New Zealand. As an immigrant child living with hemiplegia and vision impairment, and learning a new language, Muskan needed to be resilient. In order to be happy, you need to accept yourself as you are. Like, I wasn't happy when I was young. Through my experience, I realised that to interact with other people, I got to be myself first and be happy with myself. She began writing about her experiences. Teachers use her stories to help students struggling with identity issues. She's now an in-demand motivational speaker. All we should want from life is happiness which I believe comes through opportunities. They're not always made ready for us. Sometimes they have to be created. Muskan wrote her autobiography at 13, telling kids, it's okay to be you. She donated the $2,500 raised from the book to the Starship Children's Hospital. As a way to mark her 15th birthday, Muskan targeted kids who go to school hungry. Her efforts funded 150 primary school students to have breakfast for an entire term. Every Saturday we come to Special Olympics to train with the athletes and also to train them. When you're raising a young family, you often have to put your own interests on hold. Brett Roscoe decided his whole family should become involved in his passion. Coming to training on a Saturday is really good fun. I love it heaps. And every Saturday when we turn up, smiling faces, happy people, it's awesome. Brett's given 30 years to supporting Special Olympics. He started when he was 13. He's still there every weekend running coaching sessions. And his kids now volunteer too. What I get out from Special Olympics is great friends, relationship with the athletes and my family and other coaches. We get awesome time through Special Olympics. Across those 30 years, he's been a tireless fundraiser for Special Olympics, and he's inspired people to try activities they never thought they could do. 
If there's one word that drives Rachel Callender's photography, it's pride. When I'm photographing children, my main focus is to capture their personality. The hope is to encourage people to see that beauty, to change the language around disability, to give hope to families who are experiencing this new way of parenthood. Rachel's taken hundreds of photos of children with disabilities. Her book sold all over the world and led to a role as an international advocate for parents. Rachel promotes the value of raising children born with rare conditions, using her images to captivate her audiences. She's delivered a TEDx talk and speaks to medical and educational groups. And they're changing their own thinking and how they describe and talk about prognosis. And they feel like they are experiencing these children in a way that they haven't before. Rachel's own daughter was born with a rare genetic condition. Evie was just two years old when she passed away. I loved photographing Evie and showing other people, you know, this is, this is my daughter, I'm so proud of her, and putting her on my wall and, and celebrating her. Kids who play together, stay together. That's the simple philosophy of Janet McVeigh Recreation. I think the most important thing that we get in life is friendships. We've got kids that have been coming for 15 years and still friends. Kerry O'Hara took over the business, the dying wish of the organisation's founder. She's maintained the wide range of camps and after-school programmes, sticking to a policy that all children are welcome, regardless of disability. What I want to see come out of what we do is kids in the community being social, um, smiles, making friendships, and just um, having some passion for life. Kerry's expanded the operation and now helps young people to go flatting. She uses her own home as a halfway house for young people with disabilities. I welcome lots of families in and make it a flatting situation at my home just to get them to that sippy stone where they're ready to go flatting and there's no failure. The Facebook page of Janet McVeigh Recreation highlights the impact Kerry has had. I think everybody has a right to have goals, passion, a job, a flat, friends, you know, and to be with others who absolutely love them. At just 13, Nicholas Brocklebank is an experienced, tireless fundraiser. Across six years, he's published two cookbooks and raised $10,000 for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Since I've got muscular dystrophy, I know what it feels like, and I know other people out there are worse than me, and I'd like to help them. Nick lives with a severe, progressive form of muscular dystrophy. My muscle strength isn't so good, and also bones are weaker. And when you do something like sports, your muscles get weaker and not as strong, so they get sore when you do lots of sports. His latest fundraising campaign saw Nick jumping on a bike. When he started his quest, he couldn't ride more than a kilometre because of pain and fatigue. After months of gruelling training and a broken ankle, Nick completed the 18-kilometre Red Race Day and raised another $1,600 for his favourite charity. It tastes good. In his six years, Dookie King has faced many challenges. It takes courage for him simply to go out in his community. Sometimes the other kids notice me. I don't like getting stared at me. I just don't know where to go. Burned on 75% of his body after a car fire, he's undergone dozens of surgeries. Starting school this year at Mohaka Primary meant entering a whole new world. He's just a normal boy. He's confident, active, and just does normal boy things. So he's just out there. Going beyond his familiar world of home, marae, and school is Dookie's biggest challenge, and his family is behind him all the way. Whatever's happening around us, he'll get stuck into it. He's just determined to live life normally. Like he does whatever needs to be done, he'll, he's in there doing it. I'm going to Auckland. I like getting a wood. I just think I'm a normal 10-year-old girl in a wheelchair. But this 10-year-old is determined to be a role model for other children with disabilities. If I've had a bad day, I tell my parents what happened and then I just forget about it. And then I hope the next day I have a good day. 
Maya Fredrickberg was born with the debilitating condition spinal muscular atrophy. I put my imagination to use by writing stories. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. If you have a good imagination, I guess you could do anything with your stories. At school, Maya has received merit awards for her leadership and positivity. My goal is to be a pop star. And if I don't reach that goal, my backup job could be like designing computer things. When hotel manager Olivier Lacroix took over Wellington CQ Hotel, he decided to shake things up. In his homeland of France, one in 20 staff must be a person with a disability. He set that as his goal. How many rooms booked tonight? Tonight, we have 100 rooms booked. We want it to be more inclusive and it works well. His personal assistant is a wheelchair user, there are two deaf waiting staff and one deaf housekeeper. Now he's looking to expand his staff to 15 people with disabilities. What it is, is about actually uh, the best person for the job. So actually it's not about a person with a disability, it's about people having the skills and then Olivia and his team making sure those people can be included and being an accessible environment. All the hotel staff have been trained in New Zealand's sign language. This year he trialled a menu in sign language. And we discovered that we were the first ever restaurant in New Zealand to provide a menu with sign language. We were overwhelmed by the number of people who were coming to our restaurant that we decided to keep it momentarily. And we need to encourage other organisations to do the same. Diversity has long been on the ANZ agenda, but in the past year, the bank has introduced practical strategies to make the organisation more attractive to job seekers with disabilities. 20% of the population has an impairment of some form, and as a large bank and a large employer, we're servicing that community, so it's only appropriate that your staff reflect what your community looks like. ANZ has 8,500 staff, 600 are now men and women with impairments. Getting rid of some of the myths, that was a big one for us. Getting rid of the paranoia that people had about, oh, I don't know how to speak to someone, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to get in the way, I'm scared I'm going to offend them. It's rubbish. Let's just get on and have really good conversations about how we can all help people and how we can work better together. ANZ is actively working to increase further the percentage of staff with a disability. It's fantastic to have the job, it's a wonderful experience. Love the opportunities it's providing me, love the experience it's given me. My dream is that I know Auckland University produces the best abilities grads. I want them to phone us first before they go anywhere else. That's where I want to be. We've got a good bunch of guys that work together, we've got a good team, and Gav's a good boss. This is a company that pulls together. Genera is a biosecurity and pest management company. General Manager Gavin Smales puts disability to the side when he seeks new workers in the Hawke's Bay. It's about whether they can, can do the job or not, that's all that we ask. People are just not willing to give me a chance, all they can see is that I've lost part of my arm. And that's what Gav has given me, the opportunity to prove myself that I can do the job. Dyslexia had made it hard for Caleb Jennings to find work. Then he was introduced to Gavin. I wouldn't have this job without Gav. His compassion, his understanding, treating me as a normal human and allowing me not to be embarrassed of having dyslexia. Gavin's belief in them has given these men a greater sense of self-worth. Well, they're not a very emotional bunch. When I did tell them that they had a job, they a smile on their face, they didn't need to say much. <laughs> Here comes Mary Fisher. It's a new championship record for Mary Fisher. At the IPC Swimming World Championships in Glasgow this year, Mary Fisher claimed five medals, three gold and two silver. Swimming's definitely made me a lot more confident as a person. I think from kind of a young teenager when I couldn't do the same kind of things as some of my friends in the same ways, then swimming has taught me a lot about problem solving and just getting through tough times, be it in training or if other things are happening in your life. She won a gold medal in world record time at the London Paralympics in 2012 and is on track to secure more medals next year in Rio. I was just this shy upper heart kid who a decade long of, of training and planning and goal setting and meeting the right people got me to 
to London and then to winning a gold medal. Mary is studying for a Bachelor of Arts degree and plans to do postgraduate work in language therapy. She mentors young blind students and is a regular performer at the Wellington Community Choir. Keeping balance to my life, I think that's been quite important for being able to keep swimming for, for 14 years. <laughs> I feel old. <laughs> Paralympic shooter Mike Johnson's a legend. He's been world number one since 2004. This year, the marksman reinforced his dominance with consistent performances at all international competitions against large fields. Before I started target shooting, I'd never have dreamt that I would have travelled as much as I've done. Now, I went to Australia and I thought that was, that was huge, but now I've been all over the place. In 2015, he delivered a clean sweep, six gold medals. He holds the world title in not one, but two target shooting categories. Mike won his first Paralympic gold in Athens 2004. His control and precision are remarkable given his high level of paralysis. I still feel as though there's more potential for me as well as an athlete and grown as a person. But um, with this sport, it's really opened my eyes and allowed me to, to go and do things that I could never have dreamed of. Just try and relax and just get some good breaths going. At 41, he's sharing his knowledge with new athletes, potential successes. Looks like you're starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> yeah. But Mike aims to add two more Paralympic medals to his haul first from the Rio 2016 Paralympic Games. You could be at home doing nothing, could be down, but here's something, here's an opportunity that you could give it a go that might completely change your whole perception about the world. For eight years, Sophie Pascoe has been the one to beat, the swimmer holding five long course world records. The biggest thing for me is overcoming uh, my challenges that I set for myself. Uh, I always set myself very high standards and uh, once I achieve those, then yeah, uh, success comes with it. Sophie Pascoe, who can challenge the world record holder? At the 2015 IPC World Swimming Champs in Glasgow, she won three gold, one silver and two bronze medals. But a gold medal for Sophie Pascoe. Sophie was just 15 when she competed at the 2008 Beijing Paralympic Games. What changed my whole career was winning at 15 years old. You can easily win once, uh, but to retain a title it's much harder. Sophie still trains 14 sessions a week on top of studying at the Hagley School of Fashion and she'll be defending her titles in Rio in 2016. Every day is a challenge from getting up in the morning to going to bed at night but the difficult challenges of why you want to do this, why you want to be different to the rest of the world. You know, not many people can say they're a world champion and that's why I do it. See more like this at attitudelive.com. Attitude was made with funding from New Zealand on air.